Okay, let's start the show. For Thursday, May 18th, 2017, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello and welcome. Oh, I'm a little hot there. Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of This Is Only a Test. I'm Norm and it really has felt like it's been a long time, a long, long time since we've podcasted, but it may just be that it's been a really busy week. How are you guys doing, Jeremy Williams? I'm well, Norman Chan. Thank you. And Kishore Hari. I'm doing great. Great. It's good to hear. Uh, It has been a long time because, Kishore, you weren't here last week, right? Yeah, I was not here last night. I was in New York City. What were you doing in New York? I'm on the board for a foundation, and uh, oh, it's so weird. I'm on a board with Werner Herzog, what the film really? director? Really? And really? And there was one point during uh, there was a dinner, and he just, he just told stories for like three hours about growing up in Bavaria. It was. Totally captivating and weird, as you would expect. Was he? Was that the point of that dinner? Like, Werner no. Herzog tells stories, or did he just take command of the dinner, and everyone tuned their ears over to him, and he told stories? Yes, that's Grizzly exactly. Man and all his films. I'd sign up for that dinner. He he talked about wanting to uh, walk across, uh, like along the border of Germany, like the whole way. It was kind of interesting film concept. Huh. Uh, but I did I did a very norm thing when I got to New York. Oh, did first you, question wait, wait, on, on my mind: on. Did you plan out all your meals? I did. Yes, mm. this is this is the thing to do when you travel. You know exactly how many meals you have. If and if you don't eat breakfast, travel eat, eat breakfast when you travel. You you might enjoy it uh, and snacks. So how did you enjoy your New York culinary experience? First time I went to Momofuku. Oh, oh, which one? Milk bar, noodle bar? I went to noodle just because of like of time constraints. Um, but it was great. Oh, yeah. Good, hearty. It was like 50 degrees out. It was good ramen weather. Mm. I like that. Did place you have a, a pork lot. bun? I did have a pork bun. Excellent. Very it was it was great. I had I had one with pork, just like a, a traditional ish kind of bun, and then I had a brisket one. Oh, it was surprisingly different. good. Yeah. yeah. It's like an upscale pork bun place. Uh, this is David Chang's yeah. uh, noodle bar. Okay. And uh, the it, ramen's fantastic. The ramen's really, but really good. He also good. makes uh, using uh, really good ingredients like pork belly to do a pork bun. If you go to like a, a Chinese restaurant and you got a pork bun, it's barbecue pork chopped in tiny pieces, yeah, which is which is fine. There were some great ones in the San Francisco, but he took pork belly and hoisin sauce and made a really good pork Something bun. different. Wow. And yeah. A lot of times they're cloyingly sweet when you go to different places, yeah. and this mm-hmm. is this was very balanced. It was great. Mm. My favorite thing about the meal, I mean, the ramen was, is delectable, but I had a sake saison. It was an excellent beer sake combination. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, what else did you eat while you were in New York? That was my only free meal. Well, oh, because you... I had planned meals. So actually it was your only not free meal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was only uh, yes. Okay, well, it's it, it, when you're going to visit a place like New York, or if you're visiting San Francisco, it's always good to have one or two go-to places and try something new, try something that the reliable thing. Uh, we actually had a guest in uh, was it last week or a week and a half ago, David Peterson, who's a mouse guard, mouse guard, graphic novel, novelist, uh, cartoonist, um, writer. Uh, he visited us, and um, we took him out to um, Mission Chinese. Oh, that's great, too. I think he really too. enjoyed that. Yeah, and also spit and ice cream. Um, so those are the places. If you're going to San Francisco, go get food at Mission Chinese. Go get ice cream at spit and ice cream. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the new food podcast uh, oh. for San Francisco and New York. Test has always got, had food in We've his DNA. It's of, true. Yeah. Um, now... Should we jump right into it? Because there's a lot to talk about. What do you want? Pop- let's do let's do pop culture. Let's start with pop culture. Pop culture. 
Now, recent listeners of This Is Only a Test will know that one of the shows that we've been kind of obsessing over, and not because it's a show that we've watched or we enjoyed, it's because the production of this show has been so interesting and and has a, it, it, it's been dragging on, is the new Star Trek show. You so, guys love Star Trek, too. We love we, Star I Trek. adore Star Trek, and this has been ups and downs and everywhere in between following the the release of the show but we finally have a trailer um from the cbs upfronts for star trek discovery did you guys watch it i did yeah i felt like they were trolling me because this actually looks good well well let's i think it's to be discussed um <laughs> compared to that first teaser that we got of that ship coming out of a space station that looked like it was rendered on an amiga 500 there were points where i thought this was not going to be a show that would actually exist yeah, that they were they're really trolling us in terms of like they were announcing a show, announcing a cast. They announced that cast members that played one type of alien had now been recast as a different character, different was, showrunners. It yeah. was supposed to be out by this early this year. I mean, for Star Trek fans, it's it was just like baiting us, um, and it was supposed to not be have to do anything with the J.J. Abrams uh, Kelvin universe Star Trek. So. When this trailer released, and I know production, uh, the uh, the blogs say that they're filming episode six right now. We got some news, not only with the trailer, but also that this is going to be a full order, 15 episodes, up from 13 episodes, which CBS had originally ordered. Wow. I think the first episode, the pilot, is still going to air on television on CBS, but this is going to be their digital exclusive, CBS All Access exclusive show. And then they're also doing like a companion show. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about the trailer. Yeah. So you figure the trailer is all footage from the first episode? First two episodes you think first is two. my thing. Yeah. Yeah, probably first two. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I thought it was, as I said, impressive. The effects are fantastic. The costumes are expensive. The prosthetics are very good. It, it's kind of like what you would expect from a, yeah, maybe a, a movie kind it, of quality. Everything. I agree with everything Jeremy said except that first line. What was that? I mean, the prosthetics look good. The sets mm -hmm. look good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Michelle Yeoh, I thought was great. Mm -hmm. As a captain. Yep. As a captain. Yep. I mean, this show is not about her. She's not the star. It's really, uh, is she a commander? Uh, the, the star of the yeah. show, I think is a commander. Yeah. Uh, I felt like it was a little melodramatic, like these, these, the drama of her talking to like other uh, people. I think that's ship. unfair because you don't have the context yet. You know, you're just judging from a trailer. So I, I sense death coming to this show. <laughs> 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 maybe maybe uh, your, your breed of nerd was bred only to smell death of, of <laughs> TV shows. Cancellation is in the works. Um, I completely agree with you, Jeremy. And I don't know how much we want to go into discussing the plot details that were showed in this trailer. Uh, now, boy. upfront trailers are very interesting because this is not a trailer that's really meant to sell audiences on a TV show. That will come when the show is closer to release. Really? But Star Trek Discovery, it's going to be toward the end of this year. This is for the advertisers. This yes. is really about, like, this is this is a real show that you should invest in. Yeah. So at the upfronts, when we say upfronts, it is an event that studios and networks go to to show off uh, trailers for the big brand Johnson and Johnson, Target car companies, uh, advertisers to buy up ads at the head of the show's release. So, how does an advertisement for advertisers differ from an, a trailer for consumers? Well, at, at this point, because they're still mid production on the series, they have to, one, the upfront trailers are typically longer. They're like, this one's, I think, two minutes, two minutes long. They're typically more self-contained in terms of gathering footage from one episode or the first two episodes. And in many cases, even after a show has been in production or has a pilot and there's been an upfront, they may rework that pilot and do reshoots. And what may what you may end up seeing may not have the same actor even um, for this. So that's not to say that's going to happen with Star Trek Discovery. But that's to say that when you're watching the art form of a movie trailer or a TV show trailer, what you're seeing here in this two-minute encapsulation is more than is more than what they're gonna, you're going to see on television or even on the web as that show gets released. And it was made not necessarily for your eyes, but to get advertisers excited about the fact that there was one a lot of money spent on this show and big names on this show. Um, but to your point, I agree. It looks expensive. Mm -hmm. It looks like they spent a lot of money on costumes and prosthetics and CG effects. It does not look cheap. You have robots. You have planets. Um, on the other vein, though, it feels fairly predictable 
as a show to me. Like I've seen this show before, and but do you want to hate this? You no, I the- want it. So <laughs> I, I haven't seen the show yet. Yeah, I don't know the plot yet. I want to give it a chance. Uh, I think when you're talking about evaluating a show based on a trailer or yeah. anything, a movie based on a trailer, mm-hmm. it's just opportunity cost. Like this show can be great for what it is, but because we have been following the pre-production and mm. all the hype of a new Star Trek show. We're only going to get a new Star Trek show once every decade at this point. You know, Star Trek being as popular as it is, which is to say not as popular as Star Wars. Um, so for CBS to invest in a show, and, and I'm okay with the time period. I love setting it. What is it, before, 10 years before 10 Kirk? 10 years before Kirk. Right. Is exactly really? What it says in the I, feel, I feel the opposite. About that. That's if, one of the things that bothers me. If, if I had to choose, I would do Next Generation all the way. Go back to Next Generation era. Yeah. That's like, Star Trek kind of exists. Like, it's, it's funny because Star Trek, even though there's a whole history of the Federation, it's you know, 300 years in the future, 24th century, 23rd century, if you look at TOS, it really kind of is encapsulized in the 90s vision, 19, our 1990s vision of the Picard era, 24th century. And Star Trek has no future past the 24th century it did in star trek online but i don't really count that uh but it's really like this is this version which is now vintage sci-fi and for them to modernize it if you're going to go back to pre-kirk but have the ships not look of that era um it 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 reeks of enterprise to me a little bit it it, so my problem is i feel like we've heard heard this story before it's like we we have an encounters with the Klingons, early encounters with the Klingons. We have the struggle of Vulcans and humans working together. Yeah. I feel like I've seen this story for 40 years. And so I love Sonequa Martin-Green. Like, she is an amazing actress. Wait, who is uh, she? She's the main star. She's, she's the, the commander. commander. Um, but I think she's being set up as being, like, being part of an old story. And I'm okay if it's going to be about her and her journey as what it means to be a leader and be a commander on a ship and her relationship with maybe her parents. It's very, um, it's, it's, it's not exactly clear whether she is Vulcan or not Vulcan. Uh, but I was also hoping for something a little more bold um, in, in terms of storytelling. Uh, there are rumors when uh, Brian Fuller was working on the show that it would be maybe an anthology series hmm. where it would be independent. Like I, I, I'm totally okay with Star Trek being... Uh, bottle episodes with it doesn't have not not everything has to be a serialized cliffhanger here here uh, yep. and 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 there's great star trek stories told serialized but when you think of what star trek means for science fiction fans and science fiction star trek as a vehicle to tell a parables um using science fiction as its medium about humanity and good and evil and these these grand ideas that's often best told in a um in a uh standalone episodic structure and not a serialized episodic structure. So let me ask this, I think, real basic question. Would you pay like $7 a month to watch this series? Because that's the fundamental question we have. Yeah. Because it's going to be on CBS All Access right. behind a paywall. Right. And it's, you know, I'm not that interested in getting on-demand Big Bang Theory or or CSI or NCIS or whatever the other CBS shows are. You're not into um, the hijinks of Sheldon Cooper and his roommates, Norm? Nah, it's not for me. I know it's for a lot of people. It's not exactly for me. I, I live that life. Let's just say that that way. Um, but, you know, if, if I'm going to have to make that purchasing decision, again, opportunity cost, uh, I may want to spend that on Stars, who's doing more interesting things with their original programming, with Ash vs. Evil Dead and American Gods. Um I am happy that Star Trek has new life in one form or another, but like, I think the portrayal of the Klingons, as one example, tells me everything I need to know about this show. Like, why did the Klingons? I'm okay that Klingons are a part of the show; they're part of Star Trek history. But why did they have to design the Klingons to be different for the sake of being different? They don't look like Klingons at all. I'm not sure they behave like Klingons at all, as we know them. Jeremy's right. We shouldn't be so tough on this show. You guys act like you've already watched the first episode. I, I've watched two minutes of it. <laughs> I don't uh, know. No, I'm going to give it a shot, but I have to say that the paywall is going to be a really big. I total. don't know if, it, if there's any Star Trek that would make me want to pay seven bucks a month to sign up for a new service. I, d- I disagree. I think if it's, if it's. Really? 
I think that the Star Trek fans won. I mean, the Star Trek fans are tech savvy. If yeah. they want to get an episode for free, they probably can find a way. Jeremy, Replicate hush your it. mouth. I'm just saying, keeping it real. And two, you know, they'll probably have one of their Trekkie buds sign up, and everyone will go to his house or her house. And I, I just don't know if this is going to make the money that they hope it'll make. Oh, fingers I, cr- you know. I kind of like the idea of Star Trek parties, though. Yeah, exactly. That would yeah. be fun. Well, fun. something that isn't exactly Star Trek, but clearly is paying homage to Star Trek, also revealed at the upfronts, is a new TV show on Fox, and it's called The Orville. Have you guys seen the trailer, or the upfront trailer for this? I did no. see the trailer. Oh, okay, so Jeremy, you've got to watch the trailer for this. It's like a Red- Redenbacher? <laughs> it's it's, it, it's the a The name popcorn. is a little weird. Mm. Um, it's called The Orville. It's going to be on Fox, and it's Seth MacFarlane. So hmm. to set it up, it's the creator of Family Guy, the voice of Peter Griffin. Uh, he stars and he created the, the, the TV show, uh, not t- the movie Ted, t- sequel Ted 2, and he, I think he most recently starred in uh, that West Western, um, A Thousand Ways to Die in the West. Um, and timing could not have been worse for Star Trek Discovery because I had just watched the, this trailer for what the hell? Orville. This is like good special effects. What's, what is this about? <laughs> I'm going to let Jeremy watch it this. It looks like Galaxy Quest. but It is. It is this Galax- is Galaxy Quest by any other name. Wow. And the ship design, the costume design, the lighting, the bright lighting. Like when I said that Star Trek Discovery disappointed beca- me because for me, Star Trek. John Favreau's directing? Yes, yep. the first episode. Yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Star Trek to me is a 90s version of that future. Carpeted floors, bright lights. Orville's all about that this is a and and galaxy quest was like all about that too this is clearly a tv show it's it's comedy it's satirical it's farcical um but it's paying homage to the the ridiculous things in science fiction shows like star trek uh with great special effects and also prosthetics yeah and ship design so i want to say this looks great i i've reached personally like a little peak Seth, Seth MacFarlane. I, I agree also. Yeah. Um, I don't think he needed the star in this. Yeah, exactly. But I love the idea of a, a Galaxy Quest type show. Well, uh, Galaxy Quest, we were going to get that show at some point before Alan Rickman passed away. Oh, that's right. They were working on trying to revive Galaxy Quest as a, as, movie? As a TV show no on, on Amazon, I believe. Wow. So what I will say, like the, key, the reason I'm over, a little over MacFarlane is MacFarlane shows never have any heart. It's all comedy. It's all slapstick. And so if they find a way to in, interject just a little bit of heart, which is what Galaxy Quest did, yes, um, then this show can be really successful. Yeah, because the jokes about teleporters, transporters, aliens, like the jokes, of, the jokes about the self-aware jokes about science fiction and Star Trek, you can burn through those in one episode. You can burn through those in two episodes, you know, and then, you know, here's your holodeck joke, right? Your, hol- your holodeck masturbatory joke. Here's your, your falling in love with the alien joke, right? And there are a lot of tropes that you can play on, but the thing that's going to make it watchable is if those aside, you fall in love with the characters and it feels earnest. Um, so I'm going to hope, hopefully, I mean, that's why I can hope for this show. Uh, we actually know some people who may have worked behind the scenes on this show, so we've got to give that caveat in terms of the, the people. If you, if you follow any of our friends on social media, Facebook or Twitter, they've hinted at themselves, like very non discreetly to explicitly Jeremy, say, congratulations we, for working on Orville. <laughs> no okay. idea. Yeah, I, 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 I'm glad I surprised you didn't watch the trailer. <laughs> um, I don't think that biases, it's not biasing me in my enthusiasm for this. This trailer, I had not seen it before. I watched it cold, and honestly, I am I am excited for this it. This came out of nowhere, too, a little bit. I mean, I know there was announcements about it, but like it really just kind of plopped, as opposed to Discovery, which has had a lot of buildup to it. What would you think, Jeremy? It looks great, man. Sign me up. I mean, it looks just as good as Star Trek, but it may be slightly more original. So, hey, score yeah. and free. And and Fox, yeah. And yeah. Network television, free. I'll watch those ads. We yeah. are in our peak television phase, though. Have you watched anything else that's been good? Yes. And uh, I binged this past weekend Master of None Season 2. Have you done it, Kishore? I've only gotten through Episode 1, which was amazing. I just I haven't binged because... My wife and I are going to watch every episode together. Oh, it's so, so good. I, you love this series. This yeah. is the Aziz Ansari series, for anyone that doesn't know. Um, really touching uh, season one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the episode with his dad, which was his real dad, was very m- moving personally and just very sweet. And So both his parents are yeah. on the show. And I think in interviews, Aziz Ansari has talked 
openly about this show as a way for him to reconnect with his parents, to bring him into his life as not only a comedian, but a, a filmmaker. Uh, he, he and his uh, writing partner, uh, Alan Yang, uh, they won an Emmy, I believe, for the writing on Master of None Season 1, and they write basically all the episodes uh, and direct most of the episodes themselves. Um, there is a very similar to Season 1 parents-like episode in Season 2. I'm not going to spoil the theme of it, but it is a very much a very heartfelt episode as well. You should watch the last episode of season one if you, um, if if you watched it a while ago before you pick up the opening of season two, because I remember I was like, oh wait, where where was it? It, it? it is a continuation, so you need to do that. I heard Aziz on the Bill Simmons podcast uh, this last week, and he was talking. They talked about Harris Whittles, who is you know his uh, comedian friend that wrote on season one and and unfortunately um, killed himself. Um, uh, during uh, the during the writing process for that season, and he talked about the writing process and and um, you know the collaboration with Alan and and the other writers. It's really fascinating. Listen, because you got it's like an hour of Aziz talking about making this show and w- what he was trying to do different. Uh, and then there's even fun moments where he talked about just like leaving his phone in the in the trailer, and he comes back and he's like, "Oh, the world is burned to the ground." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this show, uh, someone tweeted and said that they realized Master of None is kind of like a Woody Allen, what Woody Allen would have made, except from a perspective of not what Woody Allen understands. You know, yeah. someone, and is he sorry, uh, hmm. he didn't grow up like Woody Allen, you know? It's, <laughs> That's right. Um, so uh, it's one of those shows of watching it makes me feel like I want to be his friend. I feel like I'm already his friend. Yeah, okay. All right. Somewhere. All right, all right. <laughs> Somewhere. <laughs> along along. <laughs> um you weren't here last week, ashore, but when uh, Sean guested, uh, Sean, Jeremy, and I discussed Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, I have while some we do, thoughts. While we discussed <laughs> it, some in the table may have been disgusted about the discussion because there were some widely differing opinions. And I speculated that you, who I know also listens to the podcast, at least episodes you're not on, had thoughts while listening to it. Let's hear it. Hey, look, I'm not only a member of the tested staff, I'm a member. <laughs> I listen to the stuff. Uh, all right. So I think you're being way too hard on Guardians putting too much stuff in there because the stuff they put in there really worked. I felt like Baby Groot in the ads was seemed way over the top. When I got to the film, Baby Groot, write them out. Like, they let Drax have a lot of fun. Great. They uh, Like, I thought... Why do the, you hate fun, Jeremy? I think that, <laughs> I thought the villainous turn is really m- maniacal in a lot of ways. I think you have heard the siren song of the Marvel universe, and you are you are under its spell. What? You have, you have lost perspective. Oh my goodness! You said that before the Thanos movie comes out. This <laughs> might be the breaking point of our friendship. I don't I now, don't know what we were talking about anymore. You can Up is down. What? Uh. I thought it, I, it was all. It, yeah, it's not as good as the first one. All right, they definitely put a little bit too much in there, mm-hmm. but it's still it's like a really good movie. It, I feel like it's an it a good in what way? Like good and like let's have some popcorn and go watch that movie. Yeah, or exactly. like good and like that's one of my favorite movies. Oh no, popcorn! Like this isn't fine. This is probably like yeah. I bet six Sean, seven I, in the I Marvel can't speak universe. For Sean, but I would agree with that. Yes, it's a good popcorn movie. Yeah, Sean and I have to have a little sit down. Were you disappointed those. that they didn't tie into the the current Marvel canon that felt very standalone from the Marvel universe? Look, I if you just showed me one of those post credit sequences, I would have been happy. Yeah, okay, wow. fine. Because so, it was it ties into something I really adore and yeah, a so character without I really an explicit adore. gem. We can talk about the post credit things, right? Yeah, I think it's, it's movies about for so two weeks. I, I have no idea what that was, but okay. the, but the gold lady turned around and she had some sort of. Technological cocoon. Yes. Yes. What was that? So, oh. it, well, first I'm going to try to keep this brief so yeah. that like our listeners don't riot okay. <laughs> on the podcast. But basically, there is a character in the Marvel universe called Adam Warlock, <gasps> and he's a he's a genetically engineered super uh, being, being mm. of pure. It's like uh, it's like perfection, perf- a perfect <laughs> creation, okay. and he ends up having like extraordinary powers. Um, uh, in the universe, and um, initially he was designed by this sort of pure, almost like religious-like group, and they substituted the Sovereign in for that yeah. um, group that created him. Which why, when you're a Marvel fan watching it, it, you you didn't think Adam Warlock throughout the the movie. 
But when the credits came up and you saw the cocoon and you realize that the Sovereign were all painted gold and Adam Warlock is a being of pure gold, that con- you can make that connection before she even says Adam. And that blew my mind. Yeah. And the other, th- the other important note is in the comics, Adam Warlock is the chief nemesis of Thanos. So, oh, well, like, that's, that's good then. He's going to be an Avenger? Well, actually, there's, uh, there's yeah, he's rumors more than out the cosmic, there. That, yeah, yeah. I, I, don't think, I don't think the Guardians of the Galaxy are going to be tied to the Avengers very much. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I think they'll maybe come in, in the Avengers Infinity War Part 2 or whatever they're calling it now. Uh, but uh, this will probably be set up as a villain. He'll probably be the villain for the Guardians of the Galaxy, the next Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Like a triangle. Of and, um, and there will probably be an Infinity Gem tied in there at some point because in the comics, Adam Warlock has, an, like Vision, you know, the Vision character has an Infinity Gem in his head. Adam Warlock has an Infinity Gem in his head as well. It's kind of like the biological version of Vision. Hmm. Yeah. So anyways, I, I thought it was like an A minus. I would probably put in like the five, six, five, six, seven of the Marvel genre of films. There's so many of those films now. It's tough to rank them. It's like, no, I, for me, like Avengers and Civil War are, are near the top and like they're like, you know, one A, one B kind of stuff. And then I think there's a secondary set of movies that are kind of down. And and this is where that is. A lot of people really liked the first Guardians of the Galaxy best of all these Marvel films. Yeah. And I just I like the first one a, a, a bit. This one, eh. Uh, there's also James Gunn, who's coming back for a third movie, uh, talked about some potential Easter eggs that didn't make it into the final cut. I don't know if you guys read about this. What? This what, really what? Cool. So in the film, they do flash, even though the most of the film, 99% of the film is set uh, off Earth in some, some random place in the galaxy, um, they do flash back to Earth. I think for like a couple shots, especially yeah. when uh, the seed starts growing, mm-hmm. um, and they apparently shot a scene where people are running away from from whatever's happening on Earth, and there's a theater in the background, and there is a Simon Williams movie festival Ooh. going on, interesting in the background with movie posters, and this is deep into Phase Three playing Simon Williams. Who is it? Nathan Fillion. <gasps> No, <laughs> no. I wanted it him got to cut be, out. I wanted him to be Richard Ryder. What do you mean? They showed footage of this movie in the Easter egg, like in the no, thing no, no. they didn't show. They, they, uh, it, it was literally just in the background of a set. They had a movie theater. Oh, okay. And this is just set dressing. Yeah. And Simon Williams mm-hmm. is a character in the Marvel universe. He is Wonder Man. His eyes are red. He's an he's a movie star. Think, what if The Rock, had got superpowers? Not that far away. Okay. Yeah. And then started dating Scarlet Witch. Yeah. All right. That but, part is not as But the Nathan, Nathan Fillion thing. Playing, pl- he was in the movie posters as yeah, he was in the, the posters. characters, the character Simon Williams. Crazy. And he got an extra level of meta. One of the movie posters was for a biopic, Tony Stark, <laughs> as like Steve Jobs. That's so the photo much. was Nathan Fillion playing the character Simon Williams slash Wonder Man, playing Tony Stark in the vein of Steve Jobs. That's pretty great. Many they still wanted Steve. him to be Richard Ryder, who's a member of the Nova Corps. Let, let's, let, let's, I think it warrants an inception bump. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we've warned... <laughs> <laughs> we've warned Jeremy down. The only reason we're talking about Guardians is because Jeremy no, had no, a story no. he you wanted... Were, you were here. You, you weren't here. You wanted to talk about it. Well, sure. Um, Guardi- so there's a guy who went to see Guardians of the Galaxy 2. With uh, someone and a special lady friend, yeah, special lady friend, and the special lady friend Not decided so special. to send a text message during the film. Sure, kind gentleman asked her kindly to turn off the phone and stop texting. Ten to twenty times he asked her, and she refused and ignored him. Oh, and this now, is and this date, date is date? not going they're on well. A date and now, dude is suing her for the cost of the ticket. Because she ruined the experience for now. Him. For when, when you say cost of the tickets, eighteen bucks. Now the question yeah. is, did they what? What seventeen thirty one? What theater did they watch this in? I don't know AMC. Oh, so uh, Alamo Draft House. If you watch an Alamo Draft House, one Alamo Draft House has a no has a zero tolerance. Yeah, I know. Cell phone use policy. How did 
this woman get away with using her cell phone texting throughout the film? That's a good question. They're supposed to shut that down. Yeah. Like, no joke. They have a thing they play before the movie that lets you know that. You can watch YouTube videos of people. They record, they've recorded people complaining in. Shame. Sh- they shame people using. I, I, I'm afraid, deathly afraid, yeah. to use to pick up my phone. My parents are calling me. Something t- crazy is happening. No, I'm not going to take my phone. I want to get kicked out of this movie. That's a good question. Because uh, they actually offered to give this guy seventeen thirty one. That's right. Uh, uh, actually, it's a, like a gift card. They uh, offered to do that for him so that he would drop the lawsuit because they say they don't want to clog up the legal system with frivolous suits. You know, good on them. But you're right. They should be behind this guy. This should be a class action lawsuit. <laughs> Everybody in that theater was probably upset. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen. I think the, Alamo, the CEO of Alamo Draft House issued a statement saying that very lighthearted saying that uh you know he'll pay for you know two tickets it's not a full refund but, i'm not sure this guy's getting another date after <laughs> suing his previous <laughs> one oh, that's <laughs> a good point too <laughs> he takes his movie I'm not seriously saying, i'm not saying he he's going as a galaxy Dude, seriously I, I think this guy's got his this is the right thing to do oh <laughs> this guy's got his priorities straight whoa all right um, what's next on what we're talking about? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, we have a, a friend of Tested, uh, Phil Tippett, which is kind of a weird thing to say now. Friend of Tested, Phil Tippett. Uh, as in, um, you know, stop motion animator uh, for Star Wars mm-hmm. and also a creature supervisor for Jurassic Park. Um, Chewbacca chess guy, right? <laughs> I don't what? think that's the no, technical no, term. He, for didn't, that he game. didn't do the chess set in the in the oh, Millennium Falcon. Yeah, it's chess. That's like Chewbacca chess. Like <laughs> his chess. Like what, why was why would what? He didn't do anything with the Chewbacca's costume. What's the name of that game? It's, uh, it's Jarek. Oh, Jesus. Or we could say Hollow Chess. I give up. <laughs> uh, Phil Tippett, uh, who runs Tippett Studio, uh, right outside in, in Bay Area, outside of San Francisco. Um, he has he's running his third Kickstarter for his passion project, Mad God. And if you haven't seen Mad God 1 or Mad God Part 2, it's an episodic series he's been working on for decades now. Uh, you should watch them, and you should take some Ambien, and then go to sleep and get <laughs> freaked out because they are surreal <laughs> it masterpieces. Is, it is really freaky. Yeah. Uh, and I, I hope he keeps on making them as long as he can because there are, no one's making stop-motion films like this right now. So, I think he should get. I think he should get a tagline, like a quote from Guillermo del Toro, and be like, "Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> that was some weird <laughs> shit, <laughs> Guillermo del Toro." <laughs> um, so he's launching a third Kickstarter. Uh, I think it, it just started yesterday. Uh, there was, a, I think at this point, it might already be at least halfway. Yeah, it uh, is halfway. Halfway, yeah. But most importantly, is one of the rewards. Yeah. So this is super cool. So. He's doing his very standard rewards. You can get like props from Mad God, uh, from the production, signed lithographs, stuff like that. But for the first time ever, he is offering collectible pieces that he designed, characters he designed for the Jarek Hollow Chess or Star Wars. Chewbacca Chess. Chewbacca Chess. (laughs) So so, uh, it turns out uh, the story is that if you know uh, Star Wars and the Jarek, there were eight characters on the chessboard, and Phil Tippett actually designed two more characters, ten s- designs. He actually had sculpted them and made them, and George Lucas chose eight. And so the two unused characters, those have been found now. They were in his archives, and he's going to make, I think, um, how many? hundred castings of each of them. Oh, neat. And... Offer those up, and that's it. These are the only times they'll, they'll ever be made. Dude. And they're not officially connected to Star Wars. You can't say these are Star Wars hall checks, but they are from the mind of, they are basically Star Wars. Like, they live alongside those other characters on the chessboard. It's like a character that got made for the cantina that never got in. It's like, this is exactly. this pretty cool stuff. Yeah. So, if you're a big Star Wars fan and you want a piece of, Behind the scenes, someone with a great story behind it too of Star Wars history. This might be your only chance, and they're not even that expensive. I think, I mean, they're they're a couple hundred dollars, which in the collectibles market is pretty normal. But in terms of something that's gonna ha- be available this one time and never again, yeah. I mean, for I'd a say kick, jump on it for a Kickstarter reward too is really unique. Usually, it's you know you have the standard pathway with Kickstarter rewards. This, I think this is awesome. By the way, the stop motion footage is amazing. Yeah, totally. It's legit stop motion yeah. shooting twos. Um, 
we have a couple last trailers that dropped and we'll yes. go through it really quickly the trailer for destiny 2 dropped just before we started this podcast none of us were big destiny players i, pl- I played a few times the trailer looks great it's only on playstation right yeah, or no, did, it on, did, on... did it go cross platform yeah i thought okay. so um the uh, trailer looks really incredible and it's a gameplay trailer so it's not one of those phony baloney things um I, I think it looks awesome but the trailer we should talk about is another netflix trailer netflix will not stop pushing stuff out dark crystal wait this is a netflix production yes you're kidding wow there's it's unbelievable how much like when they said i think we talked about this on a podcast a year ago netflix said they're going to double down and do twice as many original shows there's so much original stuff on there i can't keep up you really can't keep up like there's there's all uh, we're i'm staying in my like nerd corner with like master of none and all that kind of stuff but like there's like Dear White People has been critically acclaimed. There's this the one on teenage suicide. There's like there are all these shows out there, um, but Dark Crystal Betw- opens with Jim Henson interview. What as part of the trailer? It's incredible. Wow. That's awesome. And then you know it ends with one of the creatures turning and looking at you, and and it is practical. It is it is clearly a it, practical really puppet. Yeah, and it looks great. Wow. So, so I mean, between Stranger Things and Voltron and Dark Crystal, is there just a team there that's into the '80s, or have they identified that as a demographic? <laughs> I, I, no, I think they've definitely. I think Netflix, they, they have all the data, yeah. basically, for what you're watching. Yeah, uh, and they specifically go look out to find. Like, if you look at like the crop of science type shows with Bill Nye and uh, and White Rabbit Theory, uh, White Rabbit Project, like those all cropped up around the same time. If you look at, uh, there are a ton of these uh, millennial-aimed shows, uh, Dear White People, Chewing Gum, uh, which are all cropping up. So they definitely, and and then 13 Reasons Why, Mm -hmm. popping up now, and and with Stranger Things, Dark Crystal, they're definitely identifying the segments of uh, and and creating things specifically for those. It's not like HBO, where every hit's going to have to be a Game of Thrones hit and have mass, mass, mass market appeal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Netflix can, they have so much money they can just throw. But I have to admit, it's too much. It is like I cannot keep up. I like if my calendar starts to fill up with TV shows, uh, that's when I know I have a problem. And we we also know like they they have Marvel. They have all yeah. the the Marvel stuff that's all still under Netflix banner. They have all the comedy stuff. They could stop making shows and, and Orange New Black and all their all their original original programming. House of Cards isn't even out yet. They could stop making shows of all for the rest of 2017, and I wouldn't be able to finish all the original programming they've made. No. Yeah. But you can't just stop your subscription. It's, it's it's their business model. It's so smart. It's not like you bought those episodes, those shows, and can stop paying. You got to watch them all, and if you, they they know you can't watch it all. Um, mm. Then they also announced like a Witcher show. Oh yes, that's right. Wait, based on the game. Based yeah. on the game series, The Witcher. Oh. I can't wait till they announce oh. Dark Souls. You're dead. <laughs> <laughs> all End right. of show. Uh, you're totally right. Destiny was cross platform. Yeah. Um. I think it's jumping into some tech news. Oh, sweet. All right. Let me just go over here and I'm going to click that and then I'll <laughs> click this. You know, I just bought a speaking spell. I just bought a speaking spell and that's the voice. Oh, really? Totally reminds you of speaking spell, doesn't it? Oh. Yeah. 30 bucks on eBay. No, what are you going to do with it? Well, I got a pl- I got big plans. Oh, sh- Yeah, I got yeah. big plans. Maybe get him watching oh. a future episode of Bits to Adam yeah. starring Jeremy Williams. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that might be a It Might Work Whoa. episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, we'll ask Simone what she might want to do. Um, so uh, this week, in terms of technology news, lots of stuff going on. It was Google I.O. How about yeah. now? Google, Google I.O. just wrapped up, essentially. Yeah, right after Build, which was last week. They held at Shoreline Amphitheater. Like, it's a rock concert. Second, is there a third year it's been Second there? or third year. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. That's a big deal. We, so we're going to table the VR stuff for the VR minute, right? Sure. Let's yes. make an agreement. I agree. Uh, why don't we fire through some of the bigger things? Yes. Um, so Oreo. Is it Oreo? So Android O, Developer Edition Round 2, was announced. It's on my phone. It's really not dramatically different from N. It's really notification improvements. It supposedly has enhanced battery life. I haven't spent enough time with it. Um on whether it's Oreo or not, in the press room at I.O., 
they just had stacks of Oreos up. Mm. So and they're like, we're not announcing what it's called, and then they just had Oreos everywhere. Mm. So, so I will have more to say about um, about Android O soon. I'm optimistic, but it's not a huge it's not a huge shift. Um, I, I think M marshmallow to nougat. What would what do we decide that was Neko wafer? That was a bigger shift than N to O. Oh, we got to talk about. Assistance and AIs, okay. which is so the this bulk is the big of, thing. Well, yeah. assistance not just on Android anymore. Yeah, I don't. I I loaded up the Google app on my on my phone, so, but I couldn't tell if I had this new feature. So they, I mean, the big announcement is that Google Assistant has moved to iOS yeah. and it'll be on the iPhone. And let's let's also be clear because Google now has been on iOS forever, and you can do a lot of the yeah. same things you could do in Google Assistant with Google Now in terms of querying it and with voice and search. What is that big difference? But Google now doesn't it doesn't have a level of intelligence where it's getting smarter. It had sort of like pre-built features, so it would just be like a smarter notification. Yes. Assistant is is something closer to what we'd call AI. As it was the promise last year, which when when Google and, or Android N came out, it didn't really do that much. It it hasn't delivered on it. It's still because people are still um, interacting with it in the lowest common denominator way. And so what I want to actually see, what is interesting to me about it going to iPhone isn't about whether it's going to be this meet the promise of Google. I don't think it will. Are we going to see people move away from Siri to Assistant because it is better than Siri? It has better voice detection. <laughs> Dude, what? Any No, no background app is ever going to replace a dominant voice no no but assistant. like what is the penetration going to be though like because if it's better if it's if you no, can... no one's going to launch an app to talk to it if you can't launch it by oh. talking to it it's dead F- fair enough done but if it's interesting a few people might use it all right well just tell what what can some, assistant do now they showed some interesting contextually aware things so one is the google actions which are going to be integrated in assistant so you can make payments you can uh you know bring up all sorts of uh, information on like restaurants. It's, it's very context aware of what you're doing on the phone and learn about you. And then you can take actions related to that. I want to make a reservation here. I want to buy a movie ticket. I want to send this person money. Uh, I thought that looked great. Yeah, but that all that interaction happens with the assistant. Yeah. It yeah. happens within the context of either launching an app or a widget. We've seen yeah. like an, on iOS, it doesn't know what apps you've launched. Right? So that's... Yeah. Yes. So I don't know how wild garden it is. On I mean, iOS. It, it'll let, it'll open other apps, send iMessages, mm-hmm. you know, launch a play a song in Spotify. Um, but you're right, it's still walled. I wonder. Yeah. It's... Uh, the other assistant tweaks was there's a lot on Google Home, which I I think last time I was on the po- podcast, Norm was like, Google Home, don't buy it, or something to that effect. Yeah. I think we're all pretty equally disappointed with Google Home. I never used it. Um, oh, you can come over. Um, the but what they announced, which was interesting, which is on the heels of the of the new um, Echo announcement, you can make calls from Google Home, mm-hmm. and it's actually aware enough to if I said call mom, uh, it'll know to call my mother versus my wife saying call. Well, mom. that's a feature they had released a couple weeks ago. Right? Yeah, I so didn't realize they had released it. Home yet. can now identify five six people mm-hmm. by their voice and respond appropriately. Yeah, that's great. I still like I need to try it out like what they showed uh, as demos in terms of like Google Home being much more aware m- being much more capable and like it seemed like hints that it would be able to interact with my email and my calendar in much yeah. more robust ways and switch users which is this thing you, you mentioned a couple weeks ago that all sounds great to me proof is in the pudding like I, I, I didn't I didn't sort of like buy it just you know based off of what um, what they said but hands free calling. Do you think you would do that? I mean, what's any different than using your phone for that? Well, because you can just be like, hey, call mom and wander around and just do your stuff. And it's because the microphone's better than what Because you yeah. could say that you could say, OK, call my mom. Yeah. But the microphone is like a room microphone. And you don't have, have the phone out. I mean, it's just the extra level of convenience be, being yeah. in the room. But you could say the same thing about about the Alexa. No, this is That's a scary. real phone call. I think that's important. Right, right. It's not. It's not within their API. It's right. not their version of Skype. This is. I I do think that potentially is a big deal. Well, it's a real phone call with Google Voice. Oh, is it not a phone call? Can no. he not call me? No, it, it is, but with a Google Voice number. Oh, really? 
which is, is not necessarily your AT&T or your Verizon number. Wait a minute. So, but, so that's his, like the, re, the caller ID would say his Google voice number, but he could call my real number. Yes. There, yes. So okay. if, if Kishore is using uh, Google Home, he yeah. would call you via Google Voice. And that's okay. their, their advantage right now that's is fine. that they, they're paying essentially for phone numbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which Amazon isn't and I, Microsoft isn't. I want to try it out. I mean, I like if it's the kind of thing where the microphone is good and it's in my living room and I can call my mom and you know my have my kid chime in too. That's gonna be a better experience than picking up my phone. Well, this could also be good for the office place too because conference a lot of people calls, conference calls, exactly. Yeah. And, and a lot of offices use Google Voice hmm. as their telephone number, sure, as their work number. I can yeah. buy that. Hmm. One no. one more thing before we get to the thing I think we want to talk about. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I want to say one more thing about home. Oh, yeah, do it. Uh, they, I, th- I'm sure people knew this. I didn't know this. They said on stage that the home only has two microphones. That they set out, they set out, the original design was to make an array, just like Echo, six microphones or something like that. And then they, they developed some software that allowed them to do interesting isolation oh. using only two mics. Um, I thought that was interesting. I, I, I just never heard Technical that. standpoint. Oh, Okay. Uh, Chromecast on TV. Let's that's talk. Not what we, no, that's not what we want to talk about. No, no, I'm saying this oh, is okay, the one last thing before the thing we want to talk about. Got it, got it, got it. Chromecast on TV. So it's basically going to port information from Google Home onto your screen in the so, lower third. In the so lower third, that wallpaper is getting more animated and more info packed. I like this. I, I, Chromecast I like should too. always have the 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 screensaver idea was was novel, uh, but it should be more functional. Um, doesn't mean that you should have your TV on as a as like a on screen display the whole time. It's just a waste of power. Uh, but, but if you're watching TV, exactly, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, and it can bring up contextually aware stuff like calendar reminders, all sorts of stuff like notifications you, you know and what? stuff like that. Because people who subscribe to Comcast, for example, and you can get Comcast tied to your phone and your your TV. I hate that the when I get sucks. a pop up for phone. But uh, I mean this. Call. But this you can disable and enable. And control some of that contextual awareness. Do but you want also, that, do you want notifications on your TV as you're watching a TV show? Uh, no, probably not. Or calendar reminders, or text messages. No, but the lower third, in terms of me speaking and seeing a visual representation of it, it's a, it's adding a screen to what Google Home is in my. I think in my it living depends room. on notification. I think a lot of people love, like for example, subscribe to Huffington Post and want the breaking news notification oh god and do you want a chiron coming through from your from your google home not this with is the lower third scroll not with what's happening I, in the world <laughs> i think a, a lot of people maybe people younger than me are using their phones all the time no matter what they're doing right this just allows them to stare at one screen the whole time and see the latest snapchat yeah don't miss it click it now then whip out pause whatever you're watching on chromecast and whip out <laughs> your phone and Check that app and then go back to watching I, TV. I actually think maybe, maybe I would want some notifications, especially if it's like calendar stuff. Like you got to leave now to get to where you're going, like the Google Now stuff. Are there TVs with Chromecast built in? Ooh, I don't know. Don't know about Why that. would you do that though? Chromecast is like thirty five bucks. No, Having think, it built into a TV would just well, like I mean, if that breaks, it would then, be just like a, no, a value you, there, add. There, there are mm. TVs with Chromecast built in. Yeah, but why would you want it built in? Why don't you just buy the peripheral and plug it into an HDMI port? So you don't have to buy the peripheral. And but it's like an thirty HDMI bucks. Port. I don't think those TVs are more than thirty dollars. I think it's just like that's. But it, like that stuff breaks all the time. Like you know, I remember when like the Roku TVs came out. I'm like, I don't want it integrated. It will break. That's because Roku is a whole separate interface, though. Hmm. A whole whole OS and UI. Chromecast, hey. it's just beaming. Jeremy, remind me of how many times you have to unplug your TV to reboot Android TV? Once every three days. Yeah. No thanks. All God. right. Let's get to the thing we want to talk about. Is it Google Lens? It is Google Lens. Now, this is not a not a separate app, as I understand it. It is built into Assistant, and it is a way it's – they're calling it augmented reality. I don't know. Mm. Is this augmented reality? Mm, not the way we talk I about it I don't think here. so. I mean, yeah, a little bit of it is. The restaurant identification stuff? So it's kind of like WordLens, but for more than just yeah. text. Uh, WordLens was now built in Google Translate, but and that, I, w- I would consider that augmented reality. You hold up a phone, use a camera, and uh, this is actually very similar to, there was a famous Bill Gates keynote they gave at CES almost over 10 years ago now, where he demoed something very, very similar to this hmm. in Vegas. The idea that you could hold your, one day you hold your phone up and you aim it at a restaurant and you would see, um, you know, like kind of like the Yelp, uh, the yeah. Yelp compass 
mode, mm-hmm. right? Where, where a restaurant was in the distance and you'd hold up your phone and you get all this information that would be uh, processed. And here's this image recognition. So Google takes your information from your camera, you allow it to, and it runs it through its, its neural networks. It knows that it's, you've lo- you're looking at a restaurant and looking at, they have the street view data already. So they've indexed and, yeah. and um, categorized everything. And then can give you, you know, Yelp reviews or directions or other phone numbers and all sorts of other stuff. The restaurant thing doesn't interest me because when I I don't ever stand in front of a restaurant and wonder, is this restaurant any good? No, you look at a list. You look at a list. If you're traveling, though, maybe. Okay. If you're traveling, it just saves you the the, uh, typing it in search or Yelp. It's the kind of thing that once it's built into sunglasses, it makes a ton of sense. That's sure. that's the future. That's what we all want. And you're training it now yeah, with that's your phone. Thing. This is just yeah. this is all this is, is, is feedback <laughs> loop is training, training their their Star Trek computer to be smarter than Microsoft Star Trek computers, to be smarter than Amazon Star Trek computer. Did you um So plants. You want to use it for plants. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, so that that like was amazing. <laughs> so they basically use it to identify plants, you know, which is Something that uh, a, a website I not hot dog. dot org not hot dog not hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> not hot dog. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll get, get to, to it. not hot dog soon. <laughs> um, but uh, I thought that was great. What about the? Did you think a little of this was just like enhance, enhance, yeah. enhance, dude? dude the, yeah. You gotta call bullshit on that fence removal. <laughs> that was a mock up. There's no way it did that for real. That, that was a ridiculous. Demo. The, Right, I mean, you guys. You I will we'll have I, to. We'll have to test it. I, <laughs> no, I'm gonna say I would put money on the fact that 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 looked like a fake. Oh, and we, not to say it can't be done, but that's like what that's like the previs. That this is what we want, developers. Make it happen. We are gonna tr- test out the router password thing. We have to try all that. The router thing, I 100 percent believe. No, that's, that, no, that I believe it super did. Super useful. Like I take We're not photos saying of what these things now. are. So the okay, fence yeah. thing was that the, somebody took a photo of somebody playing baseball through a fence, and the fence was removed in and a post process automatically. You believe it? The other thing was they, they aimed a phone at a Wi-Fi router where the, the SSID sticker, yeah. and the password are written in you know just a bunch of hex codes, and uh, and it, the phone recognized it and then used it to sign into the Wi-Fi. Yeah, I believe that one hundred percent. That, yeah, I, I don't know. Because I, I can get on, on that. This isn't like someone typing with a post-it note writing your SSID and password but on where's a router. The, they've got to qu- ask the question, where's the line? Because there's infinite variations of labels. Right, but these are common labels for like Comcast routers and Motorola. So it won't work on all of them. I, it's not going to work on everything. I believe that they were, they're they able to do it. I don't believe how reliable it is. That's the that's the open question. And like how far away can you be until it works and like all the that kind of stuff. Yeah, we I'm, don't know. I'm, I'm going to see my phone try to connect to a bunch of Wi-Fi routers, uh, title like menu items on, and uh, and random things it looks thinks that are passwords. It, I also, I mean, it's a cool trick. It's a little James Bond, but it's also like something. How often do you do that? <laughs> once every time. Once, once, once. The answer is once. It, yeah. So I don't know. What about the VPS, the visual positioning system? <laughs> I don't I, know what to say about it. I thought it was neat. So you, so you walk around indoors where there's obviously no mm-hmm. access to GPS. Or well, GPS is not as accurate as oh, to, for, for that yeah. range. Yep. And, and it will use the purely visual-based information to try, you know, figure out um, your movement through a 3D space. And it will make all these markers. It will identify all these things in the real world. And you'll walk down aisles in a store. And as you move through the store, it retains the environment. It's mapping. Yeah, it's indoor mapping. You're you're you're, you're turning you but, into a Roomba. But it's not just what's in view; it builds on itself, and that's so, the cool part. But so this that, is just tang- This is just inside-out tracking. Exactly. Yeah. So, All this is is inside-out tracking with one camera. Great. Yeah, and we, we got to save that because I think it's a crucial part of the the oh. VR stuff. Oh. Okay. Well, aren't we going to talk about it in VR minute? Yeah, we great. are. We are great. absolutely. Uh, and then. It, is neural network the new word that we're just going to hear over and over and over again at all of these things? AI first. I mean, how are those two things like that different from each other? They're not. So machine learning. Mach- <laughs> like I saw tweets where people are just like machine learning, machine learning, machine hashtag learning. machine learning. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and I'm not. I, I don't mean to make fun. It just seems to be like it's that's a, everything we're going to hear about in the in the next few. It's years. an old concept. It's just what's being surfaced now because we're seeing the fruits of some of 
these years of research and all that data that's been collected. I was in, I was intrigued by their um, error rate for the for um, for the Google request for the assistant request. They've gone down like from eight percent to four and a half percent over the past year. That's wow. That's a lot. Yeah. It's considerable. I mean, yeah. so we're we're getting towards assistant in, is infallible. Insistent also, is although great. you could, I don't know, if shipping a product eight percent failure rate for a product is also pretty high. But isn't that something that's just ad level convenience? But no. we all know what to expect from that from voice exactly. interface, and it feels and when it's eight percent, cognitively it feels like fifty percent. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. It's but you, yeah. what is that number for Siri? Like twenty? Yeah, right. It, you know, it probably is around 8%. It just feels like 50%. Mm. I think it's probably a little we higher. You only remember the bad poker hands. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, there was one last bit of Google News, and um, this is something Jerry mentioned, which is uh, oh. Google funding the Super Sensor project. Oh, this is cool. Yeah. I don't know if this came out of... It didn't come out of I.O. It came yeah. out like this week, a few, uh, Like a week ago, a little less than a week ago. Um, so Google has put a little bit of money into these research projects. And these guys did something pretty, pretty um, innovative. So rather than putting a sensor in everything in your kitchen, these guys made one board that's maybe a couple inches square with every sensor you could imagine, 12 sensors, like something that measures accelerometer, uh, humidity, uh, you know, um, uh, sound, uh, everything you could imagine, oh, uh, electromagnetic interference. And then they, it's basically this massive sensor mesh. And then they merge all this data together, and it just listens and watches. It doesn't, it, that's actually the thing it can't do. There's no visual. There's no camera on it because people are sensitive to that. They don't want to be seen. So, but this thing can sense everything else. It's like Daredevil. And so it senses so accurately with so many different methods that when you turn on a burner on your stove, it knows purely by the sound and the EMI and the heat change mm -hmm. that you've turned on the that stove. you turn it on, what level you turned it on to, and which one you turned on, which one. Then it, it also knows if you've opened the, the the microwave door, if you've closed it, if it's running, if it's not. All by the by the electromagnetic, the spikes in, in the EMI and the sound waves and everything else. And these guys have refined this to the point where it can actually detect how much water you're using throughout the you know throughout throughout a month. It was really impressive. Every single thing you could imagine that's going on in any room in your house, if you plug one of these things in, they can tailor it to that. And it, and it, according to them, this is working. And it's I find that to be fascinating. That's a much better approach to smartifying your house than putting a sensor in every single you, thing. How big is the thing? It's tiny. It's like two inches square. Oh, that's great. And how many of them do you need for, for increasing They put. Accuracy? I think they put one in the kitchen to get all of that. Hmm. What? I you mean, don't believe it's it. It's a pretty quiet kitchen. No, no, no. And then it's not just like you have to do one thing at a time. They they started putting everything on at once, and they they showed a live feedback thing. Of what it and it, it it knew everything that was on. And then it you know as they turned them off, it's it's super cool for those listening at home. That is the norm, not convinced face mm. that you're hearing. <laughs> I'm skeptical too. It's obviously not a product yet. Yeah, they've developed this in controlled settings, but it's it's pretty cool. All right, um, on to older technology, I suppose a newer technology, older but maybe not so obsolete technology. There were a few stories uh, that popped up online last week about MP3 and the file format, the music file format being dead. I didn't know it was that, it was that close to being dead. To it's be over. Honest. But you can't license it anymore. Like, it's not even like it's too expensive. A lot of people haven't used MP3 for years now because Fraunhofer, or however you pronounce it, the Fraunhofer, Fraunhofer um, who owns the, the patents on this, they charge money mm -hmm. to anyone who wants to make an encoder or you know sell an, a product with an encoder in it, maybe even a decoder. So everyone has been using AUG, uh, the open source uh, alternative to MP3, yeah. right for, for AAC years now, or AAC, uh, which was you know Apple has always used, and AAC is kind of the standard now for streaming services. Yeah. Um, and now you can't even license it anymore. So MP3 is officially dead. But that's not the real story. Oh. The story that you can't license it mm -hmm. is because they've stopped development on it, and now the patent is just obsolete. Wait a minute, so I can use it? <laughs> <laughs> what? The last MP3 patents have simply just expired. Oh. oh, it's been that long. Yeah. Yeah, so you can still use MP3s 
they're just not going to continue development on it. And you can still right. have big decoders. You can still make encoders. Yeah. There just are no more patents. Even the even the, anything, it's stronger than ever. Well, yeah. Although even they say, even Fraunhofer says. Well, yeah. you don't listen to him because they wanted to make money off of it. Well, I mean, I'm saying that they're even saying that all these other standards are better. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They just don't want it. No, there's no point. It, it yeah. did the thing it was supposed to do. Yeah. I don't think we're going to see the end of MP3s. It's just a file format. I mean, the, the day we see the end of MP3s is the day that, you know, iPhones stop playing them. Oh. And at some point, the music distribution, the way we buy music and the way we rip music, who's really downloading MP3s these days? I don't know. Um, With all the music services, there's no yeah. point. If you're streaming, you're actually streaming. You don't care what file format it is. It just works. Yeah. Uh, the DAX will read whatever. Uh, and uh, if you're ripping, you the tool that you're ripping with is probably going to rip an AAC. Or AUG or, or AUG. lossless. Yeah. So wh- why did we want... I mean, MP3 has become synonymous with digital music files, uh, but and it may, may never go away, but that form, file format, is it's been kind of obsolete for a long time um so if, if it's dead in any sense it's only that it's never it's never going to pass that point where it's going to be more popular to AAC and and be more reasonable to use it uh over that or or uh OGG uh, personally I can't tell much of a difference between AAC and mp3 um I mean it's not a world of difference I can tell the difference between lossless and either one but to me I, I'm still waiting on an even better version of of compression yeah, it's been 20 years. Do you remember the first MP3 you ever heard? It's Metallica Enter Sandman off wow. Napster. Wow. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. I think, I don't know, I think mine may have been like Fiona Apple, whatever that song was she had in the mid-90s. But I, I remember not knowing what it was. Like, I, it, I just saw MP3 that sounds like MPEG. Maybe it's a video? Hmm. How did you play it? So I downloaded it, and whatever, I forget, I got some MP3 player. I had no idea what to expect. I think I used the real player. That's what I remember. I probably having. used a real player with a plug-in mm-hmm. to play MP3s. And I, mem- and I remember playing it and thinking, oh, I, n- I didn't even consider I didn't consider it could be the whole song that in, sounds in that three good. Megs. In like three or four megs. I never yeah. even considered that that could happen. Yeah, I remember ripping those off a of CD or 40 megs a song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, we're talking about 600 megs on a, on a CD in terms of data, and 12 songs or so. Yeah. So much nostalgia. I know. You remember the days when when uh, we were at the height of apps? There's an app for that. There was an app for that. Yes, <laughs> yes. What happened to all those apps for which they were the apps for that that never took off? Oh. Well, they could, like, if you you know, back in 2010 when everyone was making iOS apps because they wanted to flood the stores, and a lot of those apps probably aren't there anymore because they're not updated to support new versions. Uh, but there was an app for everything. While they can sometimes find new life as a viral marketing campaign. And uh, we're talking about the, the, sil- the show Silicon Valley, uh, which Kishore, I assume you watch. I do. And Jeremy, you don't watch. Uh, I don't have time for all this stuff, man. It's, you would really I know, like I, Silicon I Valley. I tried it. I watched the whole first season, I think. And it was okay. It was okay. You, now, you, Silicon Valley is like the anti-Big Bang Theory. Great. Yeah, that sounds good. It's uh, also the comeuppance we deserve for living here. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. It's too real. It's I got it. I think I, I was. Wa- I wanted it to be Office Space, and it wasn't Office no. Space. No. Oh, because it's a Mike Judge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in some ways, it's it's like Silicon Valley gets us to idiocracy. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> it's the prequel to idiocracy. It is yeah. scary yeah. on some level. Uh, so, uh, in the latest season of Silicon Valley, uh, the, the show is based out of an incubator and in some uh, um, a. Uh, a guy's a man's house and uh, tech startups work out of the incubator and one of the characters in the show comes up with an app called seafood mm. s-e-e-f-o-o-d there's a long backstory behind it but it's shazam for food it's like the punchline to that joke do you like seafood right and then you open your mouth uh, and you got food in your mouth Lots wow, of, no, that's a dad joke. You don't know that, that joke? That was some <laughs> no, serious oh, wow. dad joke. <laughs> Holy smokes. I need to break wow. there. First of all, I don't Whoa. do that joke. My kids do that joke. So it's not a dad joke. <laughs> do you like so? Oh my God. <laughs> but not I hot need, dog. I need a second. Not hot dog um, derived from the seafood uh, Shazam based app. So, so it yeah, turned so, into. So in the plot of the show, 
uh, they needed to create, they sold this idea of seafood, Shazam for food, to a VC, and they needed to create a working demo. And But they didn't have a working demo, so they coded, uh, hobbled together quickly a demo that needed to work. And the demo was they put the phone in front of a hot dog, and it said, that's a hot dog. And it said, yes, it worked. They recognized the hot dog. And then they put the, the phone in front of another thing, a banana, and it said, yeah. not hot dog. That's great. And I said, wait a minute. So it only knows what things <laughs> if it thinks a hot dog or not a hot dog and so like that's terrible but it turns out it was a really in, in the plot of the show it ended up being really useful because that's not an easy no, challenge no not spoilers. hot dog not hot dog is a tough computational visual challenge as well uh, as well as just hot dog so to promote this silicon valley the show hbo um, actually bought an old app that did was advertised as shazam for food and turned it into the not hot dog app. It and works. You can download Does it, it work? It works. Seriously? And you could take a picture wow. and it'll it, you could draw a picture of a hot dog, it'll probably say hot dog. Wow. If not, it'll say not hot dog. Does it weigh in on the whole sandwich controversy? No. Okay. It, it, Good. It has no opinions. It's, Good. it's a machine. Good. Yeah. Hot dogs are not sandwiches, by the way. <laughs> of course they're not. They're but hot dogs. I do, I don't want this app to really weigh in on philosophical discussions. I Burritos really... are also not sandwiches. <laughs> Burritos are definitely not sandwiches. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no way. I'm, I was going to jump through. There's no segue uh, from that. No, no, no. I'm gonna, no. There's uh, another story I want to talk about. Yeah, okay, I got to okay, find go it. Go no, no, I, oh, I got to okay. find it. Well, how about The Boring Company? Well, again? Yeah. Is he, is he back in the news? Oh, the new video. There's a video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, how is there a video already? There was a video last time, but this is a new video. Oh. So the, Elon he Musk. He has a logo for this company. <laughs> this, and everything. this feels like really a thing out of Silicon Valley also. Because and it is out of our real life Silicon Valley, but it feels like a thing out of the Silicon Valley show. Because Elon Musk, as we know, a man of many shower thoughts, takes long showers, has many thoughts, and has the money to spend on these ideas. Uh, he uh, shared a video from his latest venture, the high concept Boring Company, a, a company that's founded based on the novelty of its name, and yet he thinks it has real value. It is, of course, uh, to create an uh, underground system of tunnels for his Tesla cars to be ferried at 120 miles per hour underneath Los Angeles, but they're actually making progress in the tunnel boring, and there is a, they've, they've bored a tunnel, and there is a test run of their electric sled that would transport their Teslas up to 125 miles per hour through the tunnels. Westwood to LAX, five minutes. For those who um, may not have seen the video, it's really reminiscent of um, the sleds on the old MythBuster show, where like they would have like a rocket behind it and it would go down a track at you know umpteen miles an hour. Uh, very similar design, except this is in a tunnel below ground, and it it's moving. That yeah, it's like 120 miles an hour, right? Yep. Uh, Jimmy, you found the the story no, you wanted to I talk don't know about. I'm gonna get there. It's a really cool AI by Google that allows you to doodle, and it un it then guesses what you're doodling. And it shows you a bunch of vector arts of better versions of whatever it is you're drawing. So this is basically like Google taking over Pictionary? And exactly. Basically. Exactly. Huh. But yeah, it's, it's, is that just a version of you, Google image, reverse image search with vector arts? Sure. Sure. But the application but of it. But it's live. And it's, it's amazing because you can draw anything. I mean, you can draw a dragon. You can draw a Christmas tree. You can't draw on your MacBook. I can't do anything with my MacBook. Like no most, touch screen. No, I can't touch. I'm it does gonna, nothing. I'm going to try to draw a hot dog. See what happens. <laughs> Not hot dog. <laughs> Not hot dog, sure. Um, uh, if you I, find, it out. Yeah, find the name of this, we'll share it. Do I have to play music now? Uh, but no, let's do it. Okay. Let's uh, thank the sponsor of this week's episode of This Is Only a Test, and that is Dollar, uh, <clears throat> Do uh, Dollar Shave Club. And Dollar Shave Club um, is a smarter choice for people looking for uh, razors and without paying uh, a ton of money. Uh, you can get a great shave at a great price, conveniently delivered to your door, and you no longer have to schlep to the store to buy a cheap disposal razor to give you a cheap shave or spend a fortune on razors with gimmicky shaving tech you don't need. Um, and um, make the smarter choice by joining Dollar Shave Club. For a limited time, new members get their first month of the Executive Razor, which is their new razor, with a tube of Dr. Carver's Shave Butter for only $5 with free shipping. After that, razor is just a few bucks a month. That's a $15 value 
for only five bucks. In your first month box, you get an awesome weighty handle, a full cassette of four cartridges, and a tube of their shave butter. After your first month, replacement cartridges ship automatically at the regular price, but there are no hidden fees and no commitments. You can cancel any time you'd like. Um, you can try it out, and that would support them, which supports us and allows us to continue doing our podcast. Just go get this offer exclusively at dollarshaveclub.com slash test. Again, that's dollarshaveclub.com slash test. it's time for a moment of science all right let's talk about the meeting of the ants ant moot as it were ants as in ants as in the trees trees? from from, creatures from lord of the rings ant moot is sort of happening in real life what's ant moot what is that ant moot is the name for the gathering of all the ants where they discuss tree decisions i'm falling asleep just thinking about how slowly those ants talk yeah it's incredible uh in sort of a weird real life situation, there's researchers at Purdue University that have been tracking the shifting areas that trees are occupying. And they've noticed a trend here in the US um, based off of data from the US Forest Service. And that's a number of forests are moving westward because of climate change right now. Wait, wait I mean, you, you, people are making that happen. No. It's because of climate. The trees are naturally moving. How do they move? Well, they're the, that new, means like when they're grow. reproducing, yeah. they're, they're slow, like the trees that are surviving when they're naturally reproducing are shifting slowly towards the west. They're having ant moot. Wow. That's like my favorite thing. That's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, it's also terrifying and it means like the, the end of the world, but oh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> There's actually a great Scientific American story about this um, that dives into the research. It is really slow. They're not moving very quickly, yeah. but it is pretty much related to to climate change. There, and to give you an idea of how slowly the ends move, it's 15 kilometers a decade. Not, nothing's moving, man. This is like a the the right. edge of the forest is yeah. moving. Yes. at that at that rate, 15 okay. kilometers, kilometers a decade. A decade. That's actually more than I thought. That's more than like the tectonic plates move, uh, yes. for example, by many factors of ten. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> this is all it's true. measurable. I'm just happy I got to say ent moot. Ent moot. Are you the first to make that comparison? No. Right. Come on, somebody on Twitter made that has had right. to have made that joke. Okay. Um, holograms. We're going to talk about holograms. I did a report on holograms in the sixth grade. Oh well, this is going to be very pertinent. Yeah. Bring question it. mark there's a new study out that talked about one of the problems with holograms is they tend to actually occupy a great deal of space and so if there was any way we could make use new materials to make holograms a lot thinner then we might be able to actually stick a hologram on this phone now wait a minute i have a hologram on my credit card that's very thin that's different that's like a funky sticker that's not something, that, and it's also static. It only shows that one one, one image. It's embedded it's not, in that thin right. layer. Yeah, it can't right. change. What do you want? So researchers are able to use uh, antimony telluride, which is a, a type of material, and create a hologram that's 60 nanometers thick that you could imagine embedding that material on the surface of your phone and then shining a certain specific wavelength of laser light, mm-hmm. and it reflect out an image. And you want to see the image? Okay. They made. It they better, act, better not be static. It's <laughs> well, <laughs> it's static because of the uh, of the mm-hmm. of the image they show. But they're able to actually make a dinosaur hologram okay. that like shined <laughs> out in a different Wait space, a physical space, uh, than where the hologram material was. So you can imagine. What? This is way far off, by the way. This is totally, you know, well, not realistic at oh. this point. But if you had this substrate on your on your electronic device if yep. you shine the laser on it it could create that sort of minority report like screen that occupies more space we're not even close to this don't take this as science like our lifetimes perhaps yeah all right yeah apple's not putting money in it yet well, i don't know that do you uh, know that i don't know that either they're putting you know, money in corning where do you think all that money is going for the tim cook lunch probably <laughs> directly into holograms i don't know <laughs> And then I have a really short one 
that I just think is awesome. Lowe's, the hardware store, is now using exoskeletons for their employees. They're outfitting them with these kind of like fancy lumbar supports. I have it up on the screen. Essentially, they're you know, simple mechanical devices that are meant to help them carry load. And they're better than just like the typical belts you've seen. And this idea of using, you know, what is a simplified exoskeleton could be something that becomes a trend in a lot of of um, of labor situations because it takes the, the load off and makes lifting easier, makes manual labor easier. Um, are they active? Yeah. These are like people that are like, you know, moving things on on the shelves, That's from cool. carts and stuff, and so it reduces injury. It it helps them carry things heavier than they they wouldn't be able to. I want to try one, don't you? I totally want to try one. Get a part time job at Lowe's. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think we'd pass the screening? I don't think so. Maybe no. I just I love it, and um, uh, th- they actually have a three D printable one. Well, now that's not active. No. Just parts of it are three D printed. Parts of it are three D. Yeah, but then what? You got got to buy all the other components. No, I'm right. saying we well, let's uh, we can build an exoskeleton. Well, here. that sounds good. That sounds good. All right, that's uh, it. That's it, right? That's it. For I found time. the site. You did. Okay. Autodraw.com. Autodraw. Go there. Oh goodness. Okay. Auto. It's a yeah. It's a Google AI um, experiment. Mm-hmm. You draw anything you want. Okay. And I'm drawing a hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> I'm drawing. I'm, me too. I'm drawing a hot dog. <laughs> and then with my. Once you're done, it like look up at the top. It gives you all these suggestions about what it thinks you were trying to draw. Nope, that's not a baseball. I said it's a hot dog. I think it's oh, awesome. it got it. See, bam, got me. The VR minute, virtual reality this week. My hot dog sucks. <laughs> it still thinks it's a hot air balloon. <laughs> I mean, I got, that, I, I got ketchup on it. <laughs> Jeremy's <laughs> laughing at my hot dog. There's a hot dog. There's a hot. It's not the first choice. No, no. I have four, literally four real dogs, before <laughs> my hot dog is a choice. And that no, the hot dog is actually of all the things that could be hot dogs. That's like more of a hot dog roll. Dude, that's not fair. That is a good drawing. Don't it, be hard on yourself. That is a, that's actually a really good hot dog. That's better than Kishore's. Yeah, my hot dog was terrible. A hot dog. Not hot dog, clearly hot dog <laughs> clearly right there, guys. <laughs> and yet, it thinks it's a hot air balloon. <laughs> and literally four dogs. A, a wiener dog was the, the first dog. At, not hot dog. Oh. Maybe that's why this wasn't revealed at I.O. Yeah. <laughs> not, not ready for prime time. Or they were like, everyone's going to draw hot dogs <laughs> in this thing. So the, what was announced at I.O. and related to VR, because we are in the VR minute now, uh, is surprise a standalone Google Daydream headset that is the Vive. Ah, oh, <laughs> man. Worlds <laughs> colliding. Now, this is this was HTC's plan all along. Th- they made the HTC Vive, obviously, a Steam VR headset, but they became synonymous with room scale VR. Yep. They made Vi- Vive is not a brand that S- Valve owns. Vive is HTC's VR headset. And honestly, they could name they could name anything Vive. They could make a phone. HTC could have a phone and call it the Vive phone, mm-hmm. and people would feel like, oh, that's something to do with VR because they've now created a really strong VR brand. And they've been working with Google and along with Lenovo, I believe, um, to make a new a standalone headset that has a screen, has compute power. Two different headsets, right? Isn't the Lenovo? A different I think headset? that's a separate headset, um, and it has inside-out tracking. That's the thing. That it was it. Were you surprised by that? That's powered by Google, though. That's called WorldSense. So, th- which is a version of, I guess, their visual positioning system. Yeah, well, I guess so. Yeah, uh, we haven't used it. It's so. Is it the? I mean, the inside-out tracking. Number one, it's standalone, though, right? Well, he's used a, a standalone headset that had inside-out tracking. That which one was th- that? We've, th- we've used three standalone heads. Or no, we've used two standalone headsets with inside-out tracking. One. Uh, the HoloLens, and oh, two, yeah. the Santa Cruz prototype. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, Facebook is working on one for yeah. sure. Uh, the question is, how reliable is it? And two, like... Yeah, I mean, reliable in many ways. Like, what's the latency like? That's the most important thing. Latency, what What are the constraints, that w- environments that works best at? 
how much information is being saved over time? Does it yeah. get smarter? Does it retain information like this visual positioning system mm -hmm. that we talked about? Uh, Android, or, like right, right now, I actually, I'm not sure I've used the Google. No, I have used Google because you, you brought it in. Yeah. And I, I feel like it's really processor limited right now. I'm surprised there's any left over for more processes like this. Well, with the standalone, it could be better. I suppose. Yeah, could be. Yeah. Like with the f with the phone, I mean, I I tried Daydream when I first got my Pixel and was pretty disappointed. So this is interesting because Daydream is not a strong VR brand. When people no. think Daydream, they think, oh, it's kind of like the t the worst version of Gear VR. Um, Why is it bad? I don't think of it as being any different than Gear VR. I well, think it's the same. It's just it, I thought it was more comfortable than Gear VR. But because everything was just sort of held in by like elastic, it, it isn't as good of a user experience as hmm. Gear VR. And I thought the oh, the the user interface and the apps like got like hotter faster, and just there weren't enough there. At least with Gear VR, if you tap into a version of the Oculus Store, they yeah. also have spent a ton of money That's building true. content made for Gear VR. I did like the remote though on Daydream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and then Gear VR brought that. So, but this is not. Theoretically, Daydream as we currently know it, this is the whatever the next version. Because Daydream, not, there's is. no phone. It's yes, just, it's its own computer. But also functionality. Like they're they're not looking for. I don't think they're looking for feature parity with Daydream with phones. They're looking no. for a whole different type of feature set that's closer to desktop experiences with positional tracking. Yeah, uh, maybe some type of controller. They didn't announce a controller with this. It's just the headset. So that's how it's closer to you know mobile VR right now. It's right. just the headset, no motion controls. Um, but that could be coming. You could yeah. imagine there'd be a Daydream style controller that's not tracked. It, yes, at least sure. It, but in, that's in also space. not as interesting as if no. if you're going to have inside out tracking, that also should include inside out tracking with controllers. I don't know. First things first. We had the DK2 long before we had the the Rift. But it shouldn't be. I mean, it may and not. Touch. It, 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 it can be sensor fusion. It doesn't have to use the same tracking system. If I don't know how they're doing their inside out tracking for uh, this headset for this new Vive Daydream version, but assuming it's with a stereo camera or even a single camera and their Google's visioning visual positioning system, they can have a whole separate sensor system for your hands. Yeah. And lower, you know, leap motion style, do mm -hmm. some hand modeling or uh, skeletal modeling or, or have a, some type of track controller uh, using, you know, IR lights, uh, which is what. Um, what Microsoft is doing. I got. I got. I come back to this uh, limited resources argument. I, I really feel like they are pushing whatever they've got just to get this working, and to ask for any kind of tracked hands or controllers, it's just too much. I uh, mean, they announced the processor already. That's in it. It's a Snapdragon eight thirty five. How does that compare to phones? We have no idea. We have no stats on it. I mean, right now we're at like the eight ten or something like that. So we know it's a couple iterations. But if they announce the processor that's in it. That means that processor exists, yeah, and they are trying it out. So the limitations of that processor is going to drive everything, right? Yeah. So I, I, I mean, that's our big thing. This and I think the processor is going to be less used for tracking than is for rendering. Yeah, rendering is still what's going to be but the most if the taxing. Frame, yeah, if the frame rate is not good up to par, which yeah. is what your complaint was about Daydream. And you know everyone on everyone in the desktop space is saying ninety hertz minimum is what's acceptable for VR. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if this comes in at like a couple hundred dollars, I think sixty FPS, which is with with uh, with some tricks, can, could also be passable. Mm -hmm. But more is definitely better. I'm excited. I I've been waiting for mobile six uh, six degree of freedom tracking, you know, head tracking since we got VR headsets. But you're is, more excited about the mobile version. I'm more excited about the standalone. Uh well that's like uh, that's what I mean yeah yeah oh okay like not tethered yeah yeah not the one you put your phone in no 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 not in, not interested yeah. in that because I don't want to that's not my phone yeah yeah I'm excited so how much is this gonna cost we don't know how no. much what do you, I I know that what do you think I think the standalone will be like two hundred bucks whoa oh, no dude. I was thinking four hundred <laughs> at least yeah two two fifty. <laughs> okay. All right. No, I I was like I did uh I basically was like it has to be like half the price there's, of the headset. This there's no way. of the full headset. And the full headset now for the Vive is 600. But right? that's with a computer. This is completely standalone. The yeah. the screen and processor itself, the stuff that makes a phone that's yeah, going to be 200 bucks. I think this is going to cost $500. Maybe Ooh. maybe 6. Which means that Google has got to spend a lot of money building content for Daydream because if you, people are spending 500 bucks with nothing to do, and I don't count 360 YouTube video as something that's going to be a killer app for this. Uh, no, because it, the emotion is where it's at. Yeah, yeah. They, they need to actually have, I mean, put Facebook VR on it. 
<sighs> Facebook Spaces. Oh, why would they do that? They got their own product coming out. With their version of Facebook Spaces. But that's been Google's whole shtick for a while. Is, oh, you know, they don't Hangouts put up VR. On, yeah. I, what is Oh, we have to talk thinking? about that. The social VR aspects they announced. Who? Like you, Google? So you, yeah, you can cast this. It integrates with Chromecast, so you can cast it to the screen, and you can have Hangouts in VR, too, where you're doing share, you're in a shared VR space. So we're talking about big screen. Yeah. there yeah. There's a version of big screen that they're doing. Also, you can cast from this onto your flat TV in your room so hmm. other people can watch what you're doing. Hmm. I mean, the casting makes sense. I mean, that's already technology they've pretty much worked out. So I'm not surprised by that. I think that's a, I think that's a really great little feature for social VR. You know, one thing that's probably overlooked is that that's going to be great for mobile users is that this will probably solve the problem of drift. When you're in an airplane or a yeah. bus, where you're, the bu- with the bus turns, you're, <laughs> you know, your position, your uh, whatever direction you're facing, VR changes. With and they can headsets. they can use their visual positioning system to combine with their IMUs yeah. and maybe refresh one at a certain rate, refresh another rate to compensate for things like drift. Exactly. And do some prediction and and so it doesn't need to be sucking up that cow- uh, the power yeah. power. I don't mean drift. I mean when you're bu- when the bus turns 90 degrees. Yes. Your yeah. perspective changes 90 degrees right now in Gear VR. You right? know, that actually su- supposedly makes Gear VR more comfortable, not usable, but mm. more comfortable. Interesting. When when um I can see that. When you're in a car and actually using VR in a moving vehicle when the moving vehicles cuz you feel those forces and you don't see those forces, and you may be experiencing different visual yeah. mo- movement, that's going to give you nauseous. Hmm. So I don't I know if you want to use VR in a moving vehicle at all without inertial deafness. What about a plane? I No. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'd use it on a plane. Yeah. No, thank you. What else? I have used it, and no, not not great. Um, two things I want to talk about. Uh, one, a ridiculous new TV show is coming out. They got series order from NBC. Uh, I think the co- the show is called Reverie, which doesn't j- elicit VR. But here's the premise: it's a new grounded thriller that follows a former hostage negotiator and expert on human behavior, who became a college professor after facing an unimaginable personal tragedy. Whatever. But when she's brought in to save ordinary people who have lost themselves in a highly advanced virtual reality program in which you can literally live your, live your dreams, she finds that in saving others. She may have actually discovered a way to save herself. Well, this has entered the competition for worst new show idea next to CRISPR, the new Jennifer Lopez thriller where they use cutting edge genetics to solve problems, oh my to solve crimes. They, I mean, this sounds terrible, right? Yeah. Yeah. But Dennis Haysbert, the president's yeah. in it. Yeah, from 24. It could just That's be right. bad writing. Yeah. For the description. <laughs> yeah. um, How is that? A, how is that all right, the, re- the real big story this week uh, in terms of technology uh, f- on, on uh, desktop VR side is Oculus announced that they're going to dis- present a, a, um, a breakthrough display technology uh, at Seagraph this year. They did do it. They did. Oh, it happened already. Didn't they? I, I figured that's why the video was out. Uh, no, Seagraph is July 30th to August 3rd. Oh, okay. Yeah, So, but they announced wow. that they're going to do it. Cool. And the paper that they're going to present is not a product. It's just, it's called Focal Surface Display. And this addresses the problem that you and I have talked about on our show projections in using AR, which is that when you look at a lens, you're, you're, when you look at, in, in VR and AR, you're always focused, locked, you're focused to either infinity or where the image is theoretically projected in front of you. And using this lens technology, they can actually vary the focus of the image so your eyes have to actually focus on different planes. Right. Yeah. Wow. You, you, you understand the problem, No, right? I do, but that's amazing that they can do that. Yeah, it's weird. Like, their technology actually warps the, 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 the lens of, the, of the, sur- the surface of whatever the, you know, the devices that you're looking at in such a way that it causes you to have to focus at different depths. It's not perfect. Like it's not. It doesn't give you perfect depth. So it ends up being like a bumpy map of, of the surface. So is there something in between, like the regular eyepiece that you have and the screen? Then that yeah, they the optics to... are one hundred percent custom, and there's gonna be an additional layer. That so there has to be some other layer yeah. that's doing that modulation. Yeah. 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 Okay. But it's neat. Like they they show a little bit. You see, this this is what I mean by bumpy. It's like it's not perfect, but it'll give enough variation. Yeah. 
and combined with uh, some sort of eye tracking, they'll be able to uh, change you know the focus. Wow. In various areas. I wonder how precise that's going to be. Like how? Yeah. If it'll be precise enough. And yeah. All, I mean, obviously, it's something that that's may cool. have implications in both VR and AR, and it'd be foolish to think that Facebook, with a thousand people working in its Oculus division, uh, isn't also thinking about AR and working on some research there. A um, couple bits of uh, software uh, released this week is uh, the PS Aim with the game Farpoint. Uh, this is the uh, tracked uh, rifle controller for PSVR. Uh, we're getting ours today, so uh, I'll be we'll playing it and hopefully talking about it and reviewing it in a future episode of Projections. Uh, but the reviews have been, uh, I think, uh, good so far. I think the best thing is people have said is that it proves that you can do a shooter, a traditional shooter, uh, in VR, especially with the limitations of the the PSVR tracking technology. Um, I used it last year at E3, the um, the, the the rifle, and I, I thought it was great. I think it was it added an additional layer of, of motion controller um, that immersed me in the game. The movement mechanic is something that I'm really a little more wary about. I don't know how long I can stay using a thumb pad to move around. Uh, but the PS Aim controller itself, I think, is uh, 60 bucks, I want to say, and it will work with other games that come out for PSVR shooters in the future. Arizona Sunshine is going to come out in PSVR and will also support it. I think the bundle is 80 bucks. Yeah, so the if you're going to get it, get the bundle. The game cost 70, or it didn't cost, it got a 70 on Metacritic, so that's all right. It's good to see, so this is a big investment on Sony's part. I'm glad to see that. Yeah, and also if you've already invested in PSVR, I, I'm glad that there are going to be these big flagship releases on that platform yeah. mm -hmm. uh, beyond just Resident Evil because um, we want to see legs on that as well. Uh, one last thing. We destroyed the Jumbotron. Yeah! Dude, we beat the, that. Like, this is momentous news. The team you see here with the addition of one Will Smith, we took on the Jumbotron and we took it down. In Rec Room. Yeah, that was fun. I just like want, that just, game. Just wanted to point that out. We all got our loot at the end. I got the sh the worst. <laughs> Norm, Norm got the goggles. I got the goggles. You deserve the goggles. Nah, ah. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, that's it for the VR minute. We'll have we're actually doing a bunch of cool VR stuff over the next week, and we'll have the that stuff shared and impressions shared in uh, in projections in the future. Testing this week. Hey, what have you guys been testing? Uh, why don't I lead off? I'm I'm in food territory this week. I have uh, three things that I'm I'm testing out. We just finished a review of the new Jewel, and that will be up sometime in the next couple of weeks. What's the yep. Jewel? The Jewel is a sous vide m uh, machine yeah. made by Chef Steps Emergent Circulator. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been good. Uh, I'm I'm currently testing the Pico Brew, which mm -hmm. I think we've talked about on this on this show, which is a uh, a home brewing system that's meant to um, automate certain processes and make it easier for you and more reliable for you to create your favorite recipes. Um, I've made my first batch; it's almost done, and then I'm making a couple more. And Joey and I will be talking about that in a in a couple weeks. And then um, a neighbor of mine got the Cinder, which is a George Foreman grill that combines with the precision of a sous vide machine. So it like cooks what? it to like very precise. It's a grill that cooks things to very precise temperatures, um, which is a really cool device. So I'm testing that out uh, as well. Uh, so I'm in food land. How about you guys? Do real men really monitor their cookout temperatures that closely? Honestly? Or real chefs? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> how how good was that steak we had from no, the soup? It was pretty great. It was pretty great. Yeah. All right. All right, like using 100 to make your food better is not a bad a idea. Perfect ramen egg. All right, it's really so good. good. Um, uh, I, as I mentioned last week, I was going to get the new printer board G2 from my printer bot plus, my yeah. 3D printer. My God, is that an ordeal? I should have read more more carefully. I read a video with Brooke Drum, um, who who talked about how wonderful it is. It makes it quieter, faster. Uh, everything's everything's is it a great about board? it. It's a new control board for my 3D printer, so I ordered it right away, ninety nine bucks, and got it. And it turns out, like it doesn't it doesn't support the heated bed, and I have to actually cut through my case 
my aluminum case of my printer bot in order to make the USB jack fit through. No, no, no. So I like I had to get a saw that would go through aluminum. I dremeled it out. I did all this work, and I'm still trying to you know get it all t- back together. I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention like the 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 header for the um the hot end the the heat like the heated part that melts mm-hmm. the plastic. It doesn't even reach. It's not even compatible with the, <laughs> with the one on the on the board. How so do I you adapt ha- it? I have to like move the pin over, maybe get a new connector. Oh it's my made goodness. by the same people. I know. It's, wow. They didn't make a product that works with their product. Yeah, that's correct. Oh, that's maybe correct. we'll we'll ask about it at Maker Fair. They made it for their new printer, like uh, this new wonderful simple, you know, yeah. amazing simple thing with a screen on it. Um, so yeah, it's like a little disappointing. I, it, granted, there were notes on the product page. I just overlooked them because I watched this video. Oh. But I'll let you know once I get it over. Uh, I am still testing the uh, Lulzbot Mini. Uh, I talked about it last week, and I am loving it. Uh, those little figures I've downloaded off Thingiverse, uh, Low Poly, Stormtrooper, and Darth Vader. I just can't stop making them. I, I've made like eight Stormtroopers of so many different colors. Uh, you made a baby Groot. That's great. Made a baby Groot. Out put both my... out of wood and the plastic filament. I yep. made the wood one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Jeremy made the wood one. I'm testing it with different filaments, stuff from Amazon, Matter Hackers, from Lowe's bought themselves. The prints are solid. Yeah, I'm yep. so happy. I've only had one fail so far. Wow. Out of two dozen prints, um, and that was fixed by putting a bed. What blew me away was your comment that it took you like 20 minutes from opening a box to getting it up and running. Yep. I've never heard of something like that with a 3D printer before. Yeah. And maintenance so far, at least you know, a couple weeks into use, uh, not bad at all. Um, and then, uh, one last thing, uh, we have, oh, a couple tested announcements. So we have launched a new show, uh, Kishore, this new show on testing, Kishore and Indre Viscontes, who is a co-host of yours on Inquiring Minds, your podcast. Yeah. I have a science podcast called Inquiring Minds with my longtime co-host, um, Indre, who's, she's a neuroscientist and an opera singer. She's do- joined me on a new a video series called Science in Progress, where we explore the creative path that many scientists go on as they're conducting their research. And it's really meant to show, instead of the finished project, project, and uh, um, really the the pathway it takes to to get there. And we launched with our first episode, which was my ride along in a drifting all electric DeLorean. Which is yeah. kind of great. It's no, pretty awesome. Now, like bits to Adams, this is a subscriber series. This is a yes. premium series. Yes, for the tested and premium members, you can find it on our site or on uh, the Verve platform, vrv.co slash tested. Um, and we also have a new episode of Bits to Adams, which I think will debut next week. Ah, so Thermal Detonator Conclusion. Woohoo! Part two. I know people have been waiting excitingly for that. Uh, Maker Fair is this weekend. We're going to be there uh, Saturday and part of Sunday. So if you're there, say hi. But we will see videos from Maker Fair on Tested all next week. We actually actually have some companies coming in to our studio to show off their products. Uh, some right outside really our door cool. right now. Some really, really cool stuff. Uh, and then um, we know we promised it last week, but this is not episode 400. There was a miscalculation. Uh, so we're calling this episode 399 and a half. Miscalculation, I'm going to quote. Uh, basically, mm. it, it's, it's 399.5. Uh, we're going to do episode 400 next week. Listener's choice. Chime in with what you want us to talk about. Yeah, we'll try to comments. we'll try to bring in a few surprises. I'll tweet a, I'll tweet a link to a Google Doc where people can throw in some. Yeah, some it's been a long time. Discussion. Yeah, and leave. Fee- uh, I'll say one last thing. Um, with my uh, with Science of Progress, leave some feedback. Tell me what you want to see. We have a lot of shows uh, left to produce, so I, I love to hear even the, the bad test stuff. Of premium members' feedback. No, no, the bad stuff goes on bits to Adams. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff all around. Um, and thank you guys for listening. We will see you next week. Do we have an outro this week, Jeremy? We do. Justin, a.k.a. Speed, is back with another one. Hi there. I didn't see you. That's it. Everyone's worried he's going to die, though. I'm, I mean, whatever. If he dies, I'm sure it'll be wonderful. Hmm. That's it. That was about Luke.